Martin Case at 12. The 6 o'clock news starts right now. It has happened again in San Antonio. What started as road rage leads to a shooting. And now one man is in critical condition and another was wanted by police. Our John Paul Baraja spoke to officers shortly after they arrived at that scene. This road rage incident ending in the victim losing control of his truck and running into a parked truck at home here off West Commerce and Bellcross. Police tell us the victim was hit multiple times in the upper body and was taken to the hospital in critical condition. Officers believe it initially started off 36 in Fortuna. They didn't say what initiated this, but at some point the suspect got out of his vehicle and fired several rounds before taking off. Authorities don't think anyone else was hit in the gunfire and don't know how many shots were fired at this time as it is still very early and their investigation. We believe this to be an isolated incident. We don't believe the public to be in any danger at this time. The victim was transported to a local hospital in the area. He is in critical condition with life-threatening injuries. At this time, police have no information on a possible suspect or description of the suspect's vehicle, but they are still trying to talk to witnesses. John Paul Barajas, KSAT 12 News. New at 6, a man accused of shooting a family member's boyfriend is now charged with murder after the victim died from his injuries. Court records show that 24-year-old Isaiah Acosta is now facing a murder charge in connection with the shooting of Alvin McShaw II. The shooting happened on Monday at an apartment complex in the 7,000 block of Oak Manor Drive. McShaw was taken to a hospital and died the next day. Acosta admitted to that shooting during questioning, according to investigators. His bond is set at $500,000. Also new tonight, the San Antonio Police Department has cut its timeline for releasing body cam video of police shootings in half. The new policy is to release video of so-called critical incidents in 30 days instead of 60. Though it still allows the chief to delay the release, which has happened quite often. That policy took effect this past Monday. We spoke with Ananda Thomas with Act for SA about the change. She tells us it's still too long when other departments like the Bear County Sheriff's Office have policies to release video within 10 days, but she says it's a step in the right direction. I'm optimistic that if we as the community keep pushing and city council uh, joins along with us that we can make this even shorter. Uh, 10 business days right is enough that I think to turn out this body camera footage because we've seen it happen time and time and time again. We emailed multiple requests to SAPD to interview the chief or other officials for the story, but the department said no one was available. Tonight, San Antonio police are still searching for the person involved in an overnight stabbing. This happened around one this morning at an apartment in the 1400 block of West Woodlawn. That's near I-10 and Fredericksburg Road. SAPD says the two men in their 30s were hanging out at a woman's apartment when an argument turned into a fight. Police say one of the men stabbed the other in the neck. The victim was taken to a hospital in critical condition. That suspect ran off. Tonight, Florida's governor addressing the use of state funds to fly migrants from right here in San Antonio to New England. Yeah, they used Florida state funds for that. Governor Ron DeSantis says he wanted it to deal with the at the source. Catherine Silver with our sister station WKMG has more about that conference in Daytona Beach. The governor finally answered our question. How many of those people on the planes boarded them here in Florida? He says none of them did. His explanation for Florida fitting the bill, he says he wants to direct people out of state who say they want to come here before they do. The planes arrived in Martha's Vineyard Wednesday. On board, roughly 50 migrants flown from Texas on flights paid for by the state of Florida. Our view is you got to deal with it at the source. Um, and if they're intending to come to Florida, or many of them are intending to come to Florida, that's our best way to make sure that they end up in a sanctuary. The governor justified his decision to pay for the planes while speaking to a crowd in Daytona Beach Friday. So they've been in Texas identifying people that are trying to come to Florida and then offering them free transportation to sanctuary jurisdictions. And so they went from Texas to Florida to Martha's Vineyard. The relocation program is approved in the state budget, $12 million to transport, quote, unauthorized aliens from this state. The reality is that Floridians are not benefiting from this at all. Faith and immigration leaders in Orlando are calling for the Department of Justice to investigate. Department of Justice 
to take care and exercise the legal actions. The group gathered at a church holding signs and the Venezuelan flag. In Massachusetts, attorneys now helping those transported say they were flown under false pretenses, a claim Governor DeSantis denied. Not only do the peop do they give them a release form to sign, they actually give them a packet, and in that packet included a map of Martha's Vineyard. So it was obvious that that's where they were going. The governor says he has those $12 million from the state, and he plans to use all of it. I asked him if there are any concrete plans. He says the state has hired a contractor, and there will be more transportation transports in the future. In Daytona Beach, I'm Catherine Silver, getting results, News 6. Almost a month after a five-year-old boy dies in a hot car outside of Rio Grande Valley Elementary School, authorities arrest one of the teachers there. La Jolla ISD tells KSAT 37-year-old Diana Trevino Monolongo had been charged with criminal negligent homicide. The child reportedly found unresponsive inside a car outside of Dr. Americo Paredes Elementary School on August 25th. CPR performed, but the boy was pronounced dead. News outlets are reporting that Trevino Monolongo was the boy's aunt. La Jolla ISD says she's on administrative leave. The Texas Board of Pardons and Paroles voted to deny a posthumous pardon to George Floyd for a 2000 Houston, 2004 Houston drug conviction. The decision coming down today in a letter to the Harris County Public Defender working on behalf of Floyd's family. The board did not cite a reason for its decision. It originally voted unanimously in 2021 to recommend a full posthumous pardon for Floyd. The Public Defender's Office filed the pardon application in April 2021. Floyd's family can reapply for that pardon in two years. Ahead of what could be a contentious midterm election, Bear County Elections Administrator Jackie Callanan invited both parties in for tours and have any questions answered at the elections office. KSAT and other media outlets also allowed to come along as election staff showed the various processes for mailing out and tabulating votes. Also showing where and how they keep the polling machines locked up, Callanan says the tours we're all about transparency. With all of the disinformation that's out there and all this, we thought it was a really good idea to, to let them see just what you saw, that they could see and ask questions and sort of kick the tires. Case had observed roughly 16 non-media members come along for the tours, including both political party chairs. This month marks 50 years since the Raza Unida Party became a national organization after it was founded right here in South Texas. The organization is holding a three-day conference in downtown San Antonio to commemorate its role in the Mexican-American civil rights movement. R.J. Marquez spoke to members about the history, legacy, and future of the organization. You're never too young when, you're, when there is injustice to stand up for yourself and for others. For the past five decades, Irma Mireles Berry and La Raza Unida have pushed back against injustices and inequities facing the Mexican American community. We were tired of how we were being treated, being made fun of because you brought your taco to school to eat. La Raza Unida Party was established in 1970 in Crystal City and became Texas's third political party. It became a national organization in 1972. They pushed for more voting, social, and economic rights for Mexican Americans. You don't read about us in the history of the state of Texas, you know, and that's missing. Generations of members for La Raza Unida are in San Antonio for this conference. This event not only reflects on the past, but carries on a 50-year legacy for Mexican-American civil rights. We did this 50 years ago, and we were successful in doing this, and that has to be carried on by the young people. These former members and founders want to pass the torch and inspire younger generations. The movement is carries on. There's so much. Right now we were talking about diabetes and how it's affecting our communities, and we should rally around that as an action item. And while the goals are different, the spirit of activism and representation stay the same. Things change, but not your ideas and not your vision and not your energy, you know. Uh, we're, we're still standing, but we're not standing still. We need to be the change. We need to get out and vote and make that change happen. RJ Marquez, KSAT 12 News. Check out your traffic authority trans guide. This is at I-10 at Medical. And sometimes there's a backup here where I-10 heads towards 410, which is in the opposite direction. We're looking westbound, but traffic moving along very smoothly 
in both directions on this Friday. Yeah, no real issues out there. Let's take a look outside with live cam. It's been a beautiful day today. I love those big white puffy clouds that are out there today. Adam. Yeah, they were nice. They were growing up vertically a little bit today, but not enough locally to drop some rain and shower activity. Different story east of town. That's where we have some showers right now. Parts of Gonzales County, Lavaca County seen some activity and they are throwing some outflow boundaries westward. We'll see if that outflow boundary can generate anything here in Guadalupe County. But you look around the city of Gonzales and that's where we have some pockets of heavy rain, especially just outside the city. But look at more recently right within the heart of Gonzales. There we go. All right near Water Street. Boom, downpour just popped up. Some other showers have developed out there as well, but I really don't expect this to really get in the way of Friday night football games. This is brief, quick splash and dash activity that's especially far east of San Antonio. Otherwise, mostly clear this evening. Temperatures gradually falling through the 80s. You'll notice the humidity and a southeasterly breeze at only 5 to 10 miles per hour. We'll talk about Tropical Storm Fiona and its updated track in just a bit. Thanks, Adam. Still ahead here on the news at six, we're taking you inside the kitchen to tell the story of a man who founded a multi-million dollar food company right here in San Antonio. That's next in tonight's Hispanic Heritage coverage. Mexican food is now an American staple. Tonight's Hispanic Heritage profile about the late Andy Garcia, founder of Garcia Foods, who started his multi-million dollar company more than 60 years ago, making barbacoa in his garage. As you'll see, Jesse Degollado says that Andy Garcia wanted to make Mexican food quick and easy to enjoy for a reason. Where's this delicious smell coming from? The enticing aroma of chorizo con huevo in the Quesad kitchen was unmistakable. This smells like home. It smells like casa, meaning when we come home or you wake up in the morning, you feel like you're back at your mom's house or your tia's house, or your grandma's house. Yeah, that smell in the morning doesn't get much better. Knowing that, the late founder of Garcia Foods also started with two other Mexican staples. There you have it, the sacred trinity, chorizo con huevo, tamales and of course barbacoa. Andy Garcia's son says his father knew some things were just meant to go together. Peanut butter and jelly, macaroni and cheese, barbacoa and big bread, chorizo con huevo, and then tamales and family. Family is why his son says the plant, now under new ownership, produced prepackaged foods, making them easier and quicker to prepare. Because he knew the value of family time, and especially because he worked so hard and so long. Alongside his wife, Delia, in turning a $15 investment. When they struggled over that, whether they should spend that type of money. Into a multi-million dollar company making foods enjoyed nationwide. He was proud of it, but he was more proud of, of what his family accomplished, which is a direct reflection on his hard work, the work ethic that he had. It was to serve his family, nothing about personal ambition. Jesse Degollado, KSAT 12 News. Oh, if you weren't hungry before. I know. How did we miss out on that feast? I know. Much have been, must have been before we came in. <laughs> All right, Sky 12 over Market Square, where, of course, Hispanic Heritage Month, a lot of festivities going on within Market Square. September 15th to October 15th. Mm -hmm. And the humidity, it's uh, its back, Adam, for these evenings. Yeah, it sure is back, and it's here to stay. Uh, we're not going to see really big breaks in the humidity for several days. I don't think until we get toward the end of next week will you notice a little drop-off in the afternoons. But that's just the humidity. Overall, we are going to be dealing with a summer-like weather pattern that's on the way. Let's talk about it starting with the radar. Right now, activity out there, it's all east of San Antonio and highly isolated in nature. Not a whole lot. You see just a few of those little small areas of red and yellow indicating the moderate and heavy showers. Lavaca County, one just popped up north of Hallettsville. That's drifting away from Hallettsville. And then in southeastern Lavaca County, one's dissipating and falling apart. We talked about Gonz Gonzales County, a few isolated little pop ups, one of them right along I 10 there. But otherwise, within the city of Gonzales, along Water Street, St. Louis Street here, that's starting to dissipate and you go westward along the highway and toward Oak Forest and there's some areas of rain, but it's falling apart. You look at the last hour and this activity is having a hard time holding together. It is pushing some outflow boundaries westward. I doubt those will trigger anything new, but there's always that off chance overall. 
as every minute goes by, you don't see more development, the more unlikely it becomes. All right, here's a look at the satellite and radar throughout the day. As typical in this kind of pattern, it's a summer like pattern. You get these showers closer to the Gulf coastline. And if you are going to the beach this weekend, anticipate some of this to develop in the afternoon hours. Just some widely separated brief showers and thunderstorms for the afternoon. That's at the beach. OK, not so much around here. Upper level high over West Texas and northern Mexico. That's pushing overhead and then it's just going to sit overhead for several days and really not move. It'll drift around overhead, but it's not going to get out of here. It'll be influencing our weather significantly and giving us that summer like weather pattern this weekend and all the way through next week. There will be some active weather out there across the nation, just not near us. Upper level high, big blue H deflects all that around us and prevents us from tapping into any showers, thunderstorms or disturbances. So you look at the rain chances tomorrow. 10%. That's the best we can do. A few coastal showers tomorrow through Monday, but otherwise, for most of us, we're not really looking at anything in terms of moisture. And let's touch on the tropics here. We still have tropical storm Fiona. Max sustained winds at 50 miles per hour, some gusts up to 65. Headed west into the northern Caribbean right now, affecting the Lesser Antilles, Puerto Rico. Going to bring a lot of heavy rainfall to these islands, even the Dominican Republic, as a tropical storm, though. So winds really aren't going to be the issue with this. It's going to be heavy rainfall and flash flooding. And that's going to likely arc northward toward the Bahamas. And then guidance really is now coming into agreement that it's going to keep it away from the U.S. and probably just have it between the east coast of the U.S. and Bermuda as we get into next week. All right, here's a nice time lapse of those clouds today. I love watching this. I could watch time lapse like this all day, every day. It's just awesome. So cool seeing those puffy cumulus going, some cumulus congestus, one or two towering cumulus. Anyway, 93, that was our high. Three degrees above average, the record being 99. Right now across the state, 80s and 90s. I mean, we're 90 in Amarillo and Lubbock, 89 in Dallas, 84 in Abilene. Meanwhile, 95 in New Braunfels right now. Dew points currently in the 60s, so we're feeling that mugginess. Remember days ago in the afternoon, dew points were in the 50s and it was very pleasant outside. Those days are gone and that's going to give us some warmer mornings as well. And notice the dew point trend. Ooh, it's moving on us. Ooh, it's doing the worm, right? <laughs> well, anyway, it's going to it's going to be humid is what we were trying to say there. Uh, 75 in the morning tomorrow, 94 by the afternoon. 93 Rio Medina Canyon Lake 93 Nixon tomorrow, 93 degrees and overall we're looking at uh, highs in the mid 90s, not just tomorrow, but all weekend long and through next week. It looks like an August your average August forecast sunny in mid 90s. I think those dew points were imitating your dance moves. My off camera dance moves yes. or my on camera. Yeah. Well, well, that could that's it up could, for debate. It I could also be him imitating. The dew, the dew point wave. Ooh. The dew point wave. It's a new dance. All right, let's go out to I-10 right now as we head east <laughs> towards Seguin, the city of Marion, where they've got a pretty good football team this year, Larry. Yeah, uh, Steve, that is absolutely true. Uh, Marion is 2-1 and one to start, and they're taking on Carn City tonight. They are 2-1 and one as well. Coming up, we're going to talk about this non-district showdown, and we talked to Marion about what they really want to improve on this game before starting district play and in boxing. 210 Bam will put his belt on the line tomorrow night. Good evening, everybody, and welcome live to Marion, where tonight the Bulldogs will host the Carn City Badgers in a non-district football game. And how about this? It is also homecoming out here in Marion, and you know that always makes for a very fun week. Now, let's talk some football. The Marion Bulldogs are having a fun season to this point with two wins and one loss, heading into their final non-district game this season. In week one, they edged out Hondo 21-20. They followed that up by beating Natalia 35-17. Then in week three, they lost at Gonzalez 27-13. Carn City comes to Marion 2-1 and one as well with wins against Odom and Kennedy with their only setback in week two at Stockdale 33-7.
Card City, we've played them the last couple of years. It's always a good battle. Uh, Coach O does a great job over there, you know, all those guys. And uh, it's just, you know, it's a good competition. Like, we, get, we want to schedule tough te uh, teams in non-district and get those guys ready for district. And uh, th they're that. So they, they got some speed on the field, and they're, they're, they're physical, and uh, they, they do a great job. So it'll be great competition on Friday. Wednesday afternoon, we came to Marion to preview their contest with Carn City. The Bulldogs were lifting weights when we got here. We talked to them about their season to this point and what is one area they really want to clean up before opening district play next week. A common theme emerged showing the dogs are on the same page. I keep saying it, but tackling is our biggest thing right now, tackling. Uh, we wrap up, don't take to the ground, so tackling is the biggest thing. We're going to clean it up, come back district, win. We got to become better tacklers, 100%. Uh, that killed us. It's killed us in a lot of games this year. We got to make sure we get it done and ready to go. Uh, like my other uh, teammates said, you know, better tackling. Uh, you know, good assignment, uh, assignment sound. Hit, uh, you know, get it lined up pretty good. Um, just more tackling than anything is what killed us all game last game. The number one thing is just getting our guys the, the experience because we're playing some younger guys because we got some older guys banged up. So just to continue with the experience, uh, get those guys ready. But just you know, you know, the little things we always talk about: eliminating the uh, turnovers, eliminating the penalties, all the little things that we need to do just to be successful down the road. Also tonight, Lavernia will try to run circles around the Navarro Panthers, which is no easy task at all. Led by first-year head coach Brad Mulder, the Bears are 1-2 and two this season, with two more games to go before they open District 15-4A Division I play. The Bears went 2-9 and nine overall last season and told us back in fall camp they want to get back to their winning ways. Seniors, such as quarterback Stratton Hayes, all know that that starts with them. Well, being a senior, a lot of the guys are starting to look up to me more. Being the quarterback, got to be the leader on the field at all times, got to be that coach on the field and uh, just be leading by example out there. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, I got, got a lot of people looking up to us. Um, not just me. I mean, there's multiple other seniors out here. And we're, we're all leading by example and uh, trying, to, trying to be the best leaders we can for, for the younger guys. Here's the BGC road trip tonight. Carn City at Marion, Navarro at Lavernia, and Yorktown and Stockdale. You can catch the action on the night beat and at biggamecoverage.com. Now we're scheduled to stream 10 games tonight and four more tomorrow night. You can scan the QR code on your screen to see those games and the different ways to stream all of those contests. Okay, tomorrow is a big day for the San Antonio boxing scene. That's because Jesse Bam Rodriguez will look to defend his championship belt for the second time, and he is going to be on the main stage as well. The undefeated WBC Superfly Highway champ will face Israel Gonzalez in the co-main event on the Canelo Triple G Trilogy card in Las Vegas. How exciting is that? Now there's talk that Bam could wrap up Fighter of the Year with a win, and he plans to use this platform to prove that he is. You know, it's just more motivation to go out there and perform and live up to the expectations that people have of me. So come Saturday night, I'm just, I'm just going to show that I'm, I'm going to prove that. Uh, come September 17th, I believe that I'm going to perform so good that people are going to agree that I am fighter of the year. Oh, we wish to Tim Bam the very best. I'm excited to watch that fight tomorrow night. Guys, back to you in the studio. Bam! <laughs> it's just fun to say. Yeah, it right? is fun to say. Yeah. <laughs> we'll be right back. And now to new developments in the latest in the court battle over documents seized at former President Trump's Florida estate. Overnight, a federal judge naming a special master to oversee which documents the Justice Department can use while also denying their request to use documents. ABC's Ike Jochi in Washington with the latest. In her latest ruling, U.S. District Judge Eileen Cannon, a Trump appointee, denied the Department of Justice's request to resume using those confiscated classified documents in their ongoing criminal investigation. In her order released Thursday, Cannon states she's not willing to accept the government's assertions that roughly 100 documents taken from Mar-a-Lago were classified, even though pictures clearly show the covers the documents were in were labeled classified, with some designated as secret and top secret. Cannon also rejected the DOJ's argument that there will be irreparable harm to national security if the investigation stalls, saying the DOJ has not suggested an identifiable emergency related to former President Trump's handling of the documents. That's despite normal protocols which restrict where these documents can be viewed and only those with the appropriate security clearance being approved to see them. Cannon also appointing a special master to help determine what's classified and what's not. That special master, New York Federal Judge Raymond Deary, an experienced national security expert. Judge Cannon gave him until November 30th to complete his review, which is a month later than the DOJ requested. 
harm is that it's delaying a criminal investigation based upon evidence that uh, has been achieved pursuant to it, you know, a lawfully obtained search warrant. While the DOJ at this point cannot present those seized documents to a grand jury or interview witnesses about its contents, the judge will allow them to continue with their damage assessment of what threats to national security may exist based on how those documents were stored and who had access to them. Ike Ajachi, ABC News, Washington. ADHD patients could have trouble filling their prescriptions. Bloomberg reports that pharmacy chains like CVS and Walgreens are having difficulty keeping Adderall in stock. Adderall is a drug commonly used to treat attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. According to Bloomberg, Walgreens says supply chain challenges are affecting its supply of both instant release and extended release Adderall. But pharmacies have also seen a spike in demand as diagnoses of mental health disorders increase during the pandemic. Bloomberg states several drug manufacturers have had both generic and brand pills on back order over the past month. Well, the days of filling out tons of paperwork and waiting for hours to renew your passport could soon be over. The U.S. State Department says it plans to start taking passport renewal applications online. The move comes after a successful pilot program launched to help with the pandemic backlog. However, not everyone will be able to take advantage of the new online services. That includes people under the age of 16 and those applying for a passport for the first time. The new online renewal system expected to launch early next year. For more information, go online to travel.state.gov. King Charles III and his siblings, Prince Andrew, Prince Edward, and Princess Anne at Westminster Hall this afternoon holding vigil for their mother, Queen Elizabeth II. Yeah, it's the first time a woman has ever been bestowed with this honor as Britain mourns its longest reigning monarch. Meanwhile, the lines to see the Queen's coffin continue to grow. ABC's Faith Abube in London with the latest. A poignant 15 minutes of silence inside Westminster Hall. King Charles III leading his two brothers and sister in a vigil over their mother, Queen Elizabeth's coffin. The moment steeped in royal tradition, heavy with unspoken grief. Prince Edward in an emotional statement acknowledging that the Queen's passing has left, quote, an unimaginable void in all our lives, but has united the royal family and the public in sorrow. The Queen's youngest son thanking mourners for their support, writing, quote, we have been overwhelmed by the tide of emotion that has engulfed us and the sheer number of people who have gone out of their way to express their own love, admiration, and respect to such a very special and unique person who is always there for us. Outside, the sheer magnitude of that support clearly visible. Tens of thousands still queuing up for their chance to pay their final respects to Queen Elizabeth as she lies in state. The wait at times estimated to be 24 hours from the start of the queue to the entry into the hall. We've been about four hours now in the queue, but it doesn't feel like that. It's been amazing. How many hours in? Um, we're now coming up to four and three quarters. Former English soccer legend David Beckham seen in the line paying his respect to the Queen. Local media report he waited more than 12 hours before entering Westminster Hall. It didn't matter how long we were there, you know, we were there for a, a reason and, um, you know, everyone was together and it was a special few hours, um, you know, uh, saying our goodbyes. Ahead of the Queen's funeral, the Prince and Princess of Wales meeting with troops scheduled to be part of the procession. And as we get into the weekend, officials expect the line to grow even longer. They are trying their best to try to manage the wait time by telling new people not to join when it's too crowded. However, as we heard today, some people have been ignoring that official instruction. In London, Faith Abube, ABC News. Uber investigating a cybersecurity incident. It comes after a hacker shared evidence of breaching the company's computer systems with journalists and security researchers. Not the first time Uber has dealt with a security breach. Hackers stole data on 57 million drivers and rider accounts in 2016. Uber reportedly paid to cover up that breach. After the break, veterans who fought in World War II, the Korean War, and the Vietnam War, spending the weekend in our nation's capital. Why some of the veterans say this trip is exciting, yet somber. Retired veterans who served in wars across the generations 
heading to Washington, D.C. They'll get a chance to see the memorials and the monuments that are dedicated to their service in person. Camelia Juarez was there before the honor flight took off on a trip of a lifetime. I was really flabbergasted. I never expected anything like this. Ramon Castile is one of 20 veterans who will visit the monuments in D.C. dedicated to the sacrifices they made defending our country. I think we're going to see more this time because we're guided. The group will tour the Arlington National Cemetery military museums to name a few. Despite the excitement, Vietnam veteran Mario Ramirez says the trip will also be somber. Six of his friends died in that war. He plans to look for their names on the Vietnam War Memorial Wall. Well, it's sad because uh, we, we, we went together through a lot in Vietnam and we did the firefights and all that. And uh, my sergeant had only 30 days left and uh, he, he got killed. Uh, and the other ones also got killed as we were in the firefights. A World War II veteran says the last time he visited the National Mall was when he came back to the States after fighting overseas in 1946. My shipmate and I ran up and down the mall in our bare feet in the grass. And I'm just looking forward to seeing that grass and running through it again. I don't know if I'll do it barefoot. <laughs> Organizers say these veterans are living history who deserve to see how they are honored at the Capitol. Veterans will return this Sunday with a big warm welcome, something that many Vietnam veterans say they didn't receive when they came home back in the 60s. For more information about the honor flight, you can check that out on our website at ksat.com. Camelia Juarez, KSAT 12 News. They deserve every bit of that applause as they got onto that flight. Absolutely. All right, live cam outside 93 degrees, not cooling down maybe as rapidly as we've seen in nights past. Maybe that's indicative of the humidity that's out there. Bingo. See, I do pay attention you to you every once in a while, Cass. I was impressed. You're going to pass the exam coming up. Uh, I believe it's this time next Friday, right? Yeah, the there you go. Terms or something. Yeah. 93 right now, whereas earlier this week we were 87, 88 degrees at this time. We're just settling into a more summer-like weather pattern, bottom line. By 10 o'clock, 82 degrees, midnight just below 80. And we do have a few showers on the radar screen to talk about. Generally east of town, we'll take a look at those. If there's any hope for rain in the extended forecast and your beach and bay forecast coming right up. All right, would you like to take a guess at how much this just sold for? It's the Chicago Bulls jersey Michael Jordan wore in game one of the 1998 NBA Finals, the culmination of the famous season known as the last dance. Someone just paid $10.1 million in a Sotheby's auction to make it theirs. Now, if that's higher than you expected, you're not the only one who's shocked at the final price tag. The pre-sale estimate was between three and $5 million. Actor Zac Efron says he nearly died after shattering his jaw. Efron recently addressed some internet rumors that he'd had plastic surgery. Well, in an interview with Men's Health, he said his looks have changed, but not from cosmetic surgery. Efron says it's because he slipped on some water, broke his jaw a few years ago. The actor reportedly had to have his jaw wired shut for a time, and his face and jaw muscles grew from having to work extra hard to heal. Ooh. Ouch. Yeah, gosh. Okay, now say what you want about National Days. This is a day mm. I think we can all celebrate. National Guacamole Day. Guacamole makes the perfect and easy, guilt-free way to level up some of your favorite foods. Of course, you know the drill. Typically nothing more than avocados, lime juice, tomatoes, onions, seasoning all mixed together. You could use it as dip, topping for really just about anything. Yeah, there's in so my, many good restaurants in San Antonio that make great guacamole. Avocados and guacamole have enjoyed surges, surges in popularity in the past couple of decades. A lot of that is due to the avocado's reputation as a superfood, since the fruit is loaded with healthy fats and nutrients. Its versatility, a secret the Aztecs in Mexico knew long before many others did. You know what I like to do? Take a fried egg, put a little dollop of guacamole on top. It's delicious. Kind of goes with anything. I'm, I'm telling you. Yeah. You know what I like to do? <laughs> What's that? What? And my kids enjoy this as well. Okay. We play the song Guacamole by Texas Tornadoes. <laughs> 
I have the cassette in my, in old blue. No big deal. Yeah. Yeah. I have the cassette. Of course you do. If, if we ever need a way to play a cassette, we know old blue is there for us. Always. But here's right. the, I have to. Do you ever play Hey Baby, K Paso? Oh, you of ever course. Play now? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Right. And that's <laughs> the number one on their yeah. Uh, essentials. Yeah, yeah, that's the first one on. Just making sure. I've had to teach the kids, though, I can't really skip songs and fast forward. <laughs> it doesn't really work that way. It makes them patient, right? It, it gains patience is what it does. They, they learn a little patience and uh, start to appreciate what they have nowadays. <laughs> All right, let's take a look at the radar. A little bit of activity out there east of town. Not a big deal. Just a few little pop ups and most of it has really come to an end. We really uh, are seeing this activity dissipate and fall apart as we lose our daytime heating and that sun gets lower. It's hard to muster up the energy and instability to really keep these going or even generate new ones. We've been talking about this around Gonzales and it's already fizzled out and faded away. A little lingering remnant of a light shower due south of Gonzales, north of Moulton, Flatonia, I-10. Some activity there, but this is going to be very brief and I don't anticipate it to last very long. Caldwell County, Eastern Caldwell County, one downpour with a little bit of lightning, but even that should be pretty short lived. We do have this outflow boundary that's being pushed westward and there's the off chance that could trigger something closer to I-35 within the next hour or so, but I think uh, odds are for the most part against it. Here's a look at the satellite and radar throughout the day. Typical with this kind of summer like weather pattern. Most of the activity closer to the Gulf Coast line. We're saying within about 70, 80 miles of the Gulf Coast. Otherwise, upper level high, Big Blue H. We really didn't see it much throughout August. Remember, we actually had rain in August. Well, it's moving back into place and it's going to make itself right at home for an extended period of time right overhead, parked right overhead and really not going anywhere. So that's going to give us a pretty dry forecast here from here on out. Yeah, 10% chance of a stray shower tomorrow, but by and large, we're looking dry, not just tomorrow, but especially in the extended forecast. 93 right now, dew point is 66. We're not seeing that big dew point drop in the afternoon like we did earlier in the week, and we're not going to see it again for a while. Right now at Kerrville, 89. Hondo's 93, Kennedy, 88 degrees, 90 in Holotus, 91 Bulverde, and 93 measured at Stinson on the south side. Tomorrow morning, we'll start the day in the mid 70s. 75 Converse and New Braunfels, 73 in Comfort, and 73 in Uvalde. By the afternoon, we make it into the mid 90s again. So we're thinking about 94 officially here in San Antonio. At Canyon Lake, about 93, Poteet 93, and Pleasanton 94. Notice mid 90s for highs for the extended forecast. I mean, a fluctuation of a few degrees. Anywhere from 94 to 96 for high temperatures tomorrow all the way through the end of next week. And that's actually near our August average. So that's your climatological average for August. So it's a summer like weather pattern that's setting up, but we're not talking 100 degrees like we had most of our summer. Dew points now well into the 60s and tomorrow. Here's the <laughs> the modified wormy dew point trend. It's not moving on. It's not dancing right now. We fixed that, but dew points tomorrow starting in the mid 70s in the morning. Very, very sticky and then only dropping down maybe into the upper 60s by the afternoon. Temperature wise 75 at 7 a.m. and I think a decent amount of cloud cover early 94 the afternoon high mid 90s again on Sunday. Just rinse and repeat a southeasterly breeze at 5 to 15 headed to the Bay or Beach. There will be a slight chop on the waters of the bay. Back Bay is just a slight chop. It actually should be pretty decent. Gulf seas at about two to three feet and anticipate some afternoon showers widely separated along the beach and the bays during the afternoons this weekend. But that right there looks like a typical summertime forecast here. Yes, it does. Thank you, Adam. In case you missed it, coming up next. It is Friday. We made it to the end of the week, September 16th. A road rage incident escalating into a shooting with one person in the hospital and another on the run. Police tell us the victim was hit multiple times in the upper body and was taken to the hospital in critical condition. Officers believe it initially started off 36 in Fortuna. They didn't say what initiated this, but at some point the suspect got out of his vehicle and fired several rounds before taking off. Authorities don't think anyone else was hit in the gunfire and don't know how many shots were fired at this time as it is still very early in their investigation. I believe this to be an isolated incident. We don't believe the public to be in any danger at this time. The victim was transported to a local hospital in the area. 
He is in critical condition with life-threatening injuries. San Antonio fire crews were called out to a house fire last night, and this was a scene over at the fire on Eagle Ridge around 9 p.m. Now, crews say the home was covered in flames earlier in the evening. So far, there are no reports of any injuries, but there are some missing pets. Here's something to mark on your calendar for tomorrow. Registration open for the ninth annual Head for the Cure, the 5K run and walk, raising awareness and funds to fight brain cancer. KSAT 12's former news director, Jim Boyle, was diagnosed with glioblastoma. He passed away, but that legacy lives on. His daughter helped to kick off this event outside of KSAT Studios all the way back in 2014. Since then, it's grown with more families running for the survivors and in remembrance of their loved ones. This year, it all kicks off on the 24th. You can register right now on KSAT.com. Use the promo code KSAT and get $5 off the registration fee. All right, here's a quick look at the tropics and tropical storm Fiona we have out there moving into the northern Caribbean right now. We're going to bring some heavy rainfall to some of the islands, especially Puerto Rico and particularly Dominican Republic, then as a tropical storm. So wind's not really the issue, but then it veers north back into the Atlantic and should become a Cat 1 hurricane. Right now, no threat to U.S. Thanks for watching the news at 6. See you at 10.